Good to see you. How you doing? Doing well. Always a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Uh, I'm coming at you today from Tucson, Arizona, down here visiting my son. As you can see, a beautiful background, cactuses, swimming pools. Cacti. Know. Cacti. There you go. Cacti. So anyway, um, you know, <laughs> we, we put this uh, episode up with uh, our buddy Jacob and uh, – started getting a lot of uh, uh, feedback and I know our, even our production guy was getting some heat on, uh, on Twitter, which was, uh, you know, kind of comical. I thought anyway. Yeah. Pod podcasting is so funny. Uh, you hear everything. So I heard, for example, when I uploaded that video of we did about how to win big by starting small and we were in the Ritz Carlton and people sure. were, I uploaded the video and I'm on my phone and people are, of course, losing their minds over it. And I'm like, dude, I'm with Mike. Like everybody, you know, everybody knows that I'm, I'm working, you know, I'm working on my phone. Why do you people care so much? And they were like enraged. I, I can't believe it. This is so rude. It's like, well, the people I'm with don't think it's rude. Well, why don't you mind your own business? And they, they nitpick everything. And then of course you have, we were talking a little bit earlier off camera about the, just the insane troll messages. That, that people are sending already. Yeah. And you know what, even on that, that particular podcast, that one, we, I don't even know if we really meant to shoot a podcast. We, we had just finished our whiskey tasting taste off and you and I were getting caught up on some things on our phone and our laptop. And we were kind of casually having a conversation and it turned into a podcast. So, you know, it wasn't like I, I didn't interpret it as being rude. And I don't even think that the uh, production guy who's watching both of us like a hawk, even mentioned it to me. So, uh, you know, not an issue for me, that's for sure. But yeah, I mean, the, the Twitter troll guys, I'll tell you what, you, you get these guys with, you know, 42 followers, and they just start hammering on, I mean, the the smallest thing. I, I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not a Joe Rogan uh, kind of guy. We're learning, you know, I know you've been doing podcasting for a long time, but technology is constantly evolving. And I think every one of these that we do gets a little bit better than the last one. And that's, that's what it's all about is, you know, this isn't like a uh, Johnny Carson tonight kind of production. Um, you know, we're just trying to add some value to people's lives by telling them what's going on and what we're thinking about certain things. And you've got your expertise. I got my expertise. And so why not share that? Um, you know, if somebody wants to bitch about sound quality or something on a single episode, then, you know, let them do it. Well, people with every new project, you're finding a vibe. You're finding your what you want to talk about, what people want to hear about. And so far, people are liking this pot. It's actually taking off a little bit quicker than I thought. A lot of people are saying, "Oh yeah, I love this new one that you guys are doing." So people so far seem to seem to enjoy it. Well, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's it's kind of cool when you get two guys that are really and you know. Uh, compliment each other in certain ways. I think you had written a little article about that. And, uh, you know, it's nice to like kind of bounce some ideas back and forth. Uh, you're uh, a little bit more uh, analytical or maybe theoretical than me, where I'm more the kind of guy that, you know, charges in and, and figures it out, uh, you know, business wise. And so that's kind of been my thing. I have not been a social media guy. I haven't been an artistic guy or a creative kind of guy other than you know, creative in my uh, real estate and business endeavors. So, uh, you know, so it's a good compliment to each other. It's interesting. Yeah, people, and you give people what they want. And people, of course, who don't listen are the most angry. That, that's the number one thing I've learned over the years. And you would think it would be the other way, but the people who have really backed projects of mine, like significantly, I'll email them and say, hey, I, I almost feel kind of bad. What can I do for you? They're like, oh, no, you're great. You're the best just we want to help you know get this stuff out and everything's cool and then the yeah. people who complain i'll run their name through like the customer database never bought anything right so the, the <laughs> and, and that's where creators get twisted is that the you because you, you think the people who are the loudest and the most vocal are the most relevant and you're like oh they're telling me to do it this way they're telling me to do it that way oh maybe i should change up my game and you realize no those people are complete deadbeat losers who they're either trying to sabotage you or they're just so toxic that you don't want to attract more people like that. And then the people who are super positive, they don't rarely compliment. They just buy from you. They're just, if you release a book, they just buy your book. They, they don't ever say anything either nice or mean. And you learn that right. as you go through. Well, yeah, and it's interesting, too, because, you know, yeah, if you have a, a sound quality or production quality issue or something, but the content's good, and I think that, you know, 
I, I mean, I had lots of messages from people asking me, hey, you know, this is really interesting. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? Can you elaborate on that? Nothing about, you know, a production quality or anything like that. That's always the guy. And it's funny that um, our production guy, Pat, was telling me that, you know, hey, we could do a, uh, a podcast you know, on uh, AOC and these exact same people would be like, hey, this was the best podcast I've ever seen. The production value is amazing, you know? And so it's just, I, I think a lot of people approach it from from their vantage point and, you know, not necessarily from what, you know, the content of the, of the product is. And there, there are people who are, there, the people who complain, generally speaking, and, and again, it's a chicken and egg. I think we talked about this in a previous podcast is yeah. there... Either it's because they're struggling in life, they're negative, or they're, they're negative because they're struggling in life. You never can quite know. But either way, their, their advice just isn't going to be good. I, I yeah. don't listen to it. And, and so many people that I met throughout the years, primarily women, uh, have not done more because they listen to the haters. They let those one or two or 10 or in my case, the thousands of people. I literally have thousands of people who do nothing but stalk my Twitter and reply to people and DM people. If a reporter writes an article about me and it doesn't refer to me as, you know, Charles Manson's second coming, they email the reporters and death threats to the reporters. Just if you just mention me in an article. And that's why, so, yeah, I'm, I'm rarely mentioning media articles anymore because they all get death threats from these trolls whenever they mention me. Well, so what is this? I, I thought it was comical because, you know, I mean, I, I know you from reading your book and I mean, that's kind of how I got introduced to, you know, your, your side of the, uh, uh, I guess that's how I got introduced to Mike Cernovich was reading Gorilla Mindset and some of your blog stuff on mindset and like, you know, more from an analytical or business side. And I get this guy that uh, actually two people messaged me. Uh, over the past couple of days and said, hey, how come you're doing a podcast with weird Mike Cernovich? Now, what is weird Mike Cernovich? What, what the hell are they talking about? There's a far left-wing podcast called El Chapo Trap House. And they, they talk about me all the time on their podcast. It, and they so-called make fun of me or whatever. So when anybody does something with me, <clears throat> they'll pretend to be a fan of yours and say, hey, man, I just want to let you know this Mike guy, he's, he's a real bad person. I really like your stuff. You, you need to be careful. It's called concern trolling. And so, so they do, yeah, yeah. They, they, Did they, you coin that phrase, concerned trolling? No, it's a well-known well phenomenon where you pretend to like the person to troll them. Oh, Mike, you seem like a real good guy. You probably didn't know this thing about Cernovich. Just letting you know because I really love your stuff and I hate to see you end up in a bad place with this with this other guy so they try every tactic they'll concern it, it reminds me of a uh, sophomore year in high school oh high school never ends man <laughs> no i mean high school high school never ends it's a bizarre world it, 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 i live a surreal life that's for sure well hey listen shifting gears i think i had sent you a i texted you a a photo of a little uh, package delivery that i received so i ordered some uh and by the way folks if you got a buddy that's out there, you know, doing something, whether it be an event, a book, uh, a product, whatever it is, you should really try to support that. You know, if it's somebody that, that uh, you know, you appreciate their work. But anyway, I would never in a million years ask Mike uh, for a product. But anyway, I went ahead and ordered a uh, some skincare uh, stuff and I included the uh, Gorilla Serum in that. And then I got some uh, Gorilla Dream. And it was interesting because I, I sent Mike a photo and I, I don't even, you certainly didn't even know I ordered the stuff. And I was like, Hey, I just got this. So I'm down here in, in uh, Tucson visiting my son and I got it in the back of my car. And guess what? It's gone. He took it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> he, he took the serum and he took the gorilla dream. So I'm going to have to reorder that. So I'm sure he'll enjoy both, but I just thought that was, that was funny. Yeah. So. I, well, I quit. Um, I hadn't been disciplined with my skincare re uh, regime and, I'm 41, so a week or two it shows, and yeah. I was like, man, I'm looking a little uh, not quite as fresh. You, 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 you learn one thing. I always teach my guys. I've done periscopes about this. Is you learn about language patterns, fresh faced. You don't uh -huh. really appreciate that when you're 21 and you have pimples and a greasy forehead and everything, right? It's more like right. the opposite. You're trying to, you know, use Stridex pads or whatever to to clean your face, and then. 
that natural moisturizing um, element of your skin starts to decrease over the years. And if you don't do something about it, that's how people end up with really bad wrinkles. Your skin gets dry and then the wrinkles are able to set in. Whereas if you keep your skin hyper moisturized, then your skin remains supple and it, the wrinkles don't really set in as aggressively as they do with other people. Well, you know, it's, uh, I'm working on a whole bunch of stuff in my life right now, trying to get a little bit more balanced and, and not just do work. And so one of the things I'm doing while I'm down here in um, Arizona is I'm going over to uh, Scottsdale a little bit later today uh, after I get done, you know, hanging out with my son here. And I'm going to work out with my uh, personal trainer. Uh, the guy's name is Danny Page. And, you know, he's one of these guys like, you know, big Instagram following, but, you know, big weightlifter and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things he was telling me was, hey, you know, not just uh, weightlifting, but we got to do nutrition. We're going to, you know, I've been doing the cardio stuff, trying to get in back into fighting shape, so to speak. And one of the things we were talking about was this whole like skincare thing. He's like, you know, it's just a whole body thing. You really got to take care of everything. And so anyway, uh, our production guy, Pat, said uh, he read this uh, I think it was an email that you had sent out, maybe an uh, email blast. And he said, Mike, you know, if you work really hard, you might be able to get a, a guest spot on uh, the Mike Cernovich and the Jay uh, podcast, but not yet because you're still working on it. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk <laughs> real estate. Yeah. So yeah, I, actually, I sent out the podcast. We got to get, we got to get other Mike, other, other Mike back in shape and then you can talk health and fitness. <laughs> that's right. He's not allowed to be on that podcast until he loses 40 pounds. That's no, it. I didn't word it that way. I was much more. I'm a lawyer. I, I know how to work things much more politely. Uh, I, oh, gosh. We, well, we got a kick out of it. It was funny. I was like, so. well, we got, and, and, I, and ideally we're building – well, hopefully we can get you in great shape. Your trainer does, and we can monetize that, you know, because I'm, I'm a big believer in that. I'm a big believer in take a lot of before pictures because well you can do i have done the before pictures you guys can do a little thing uh biscuits and gravy eater to a uh, yoked bro or something you know well you got to find your own no no the, the way if i were marketing it let's say you drop let's say you drop 60 pounds we would say how a successful entrepreneur made it in business but then almost lost it all hi ah, i like that hi i'm mike Belin, and i became obsessed with success but then I noticed something. I went to my doctor and he told me, you only have five years left to live. I was mortified. It was all of this hard work for nothing? What should I do? Then I met Mike and Jay. And after doing the Mike... <laughs> <laughs> and they actually let me come on the podcast for 10 minutes as I a really... guest because I lost some weight. So now I'm in. I'm in with uh, the cool guys. Yeah, I really wanted to be on the Mike and Jay show. Here's That's the program. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. But that, that would funny. be, that would be the, that's how I, it's, it's funny. That's actually how my mind goes. It immediately goes into product. I, I have a product marketing mindset, which is if you're on a diet, log everything, take pictures. If, if you don't end up getting where you want to be, Hey, whatever, just throw this stuff away. If you get to where you want to be, now you got a product, man. And nothing sells like before, before and after pictures are so effective. Most people don't know this. They're banned from Facebook. You can't post. really. Yeah, because it's body shaming. No, it's, you can't run a Facebook ad. Oh, with that Nobody believes this, and then everybody <laughs> looks it up, and they're like, holy <laughs> shit, that's really true. Yeah, you can't I, you, run before you, and after pics on Facebook. I'll tell you, some of the stuff that I've learned from you, just some of these little nuances about what they allow and don't allow on some of these platforms, seriously, we could do, we could do a whole show on that. Okay, so I was on a podcast uh, earlier this week, and that particular episode has jumped up into the top 100 uh, episode, uh, I downloaded episodes on iTunes and, uh, I've had a lot of messages from that podcast and I, people asking me a few things. And so I'll, I'll run through a couple things oh, yeah. real quick, uh, regarding that. And so here's the thing. If you're, if people are always asking me, how do I get into real estate investing? How do I get into it? I don't have any money. Okay. And that's one of the common ones I get. So a lot of people get into real estate investing by doing what's called wholesaling real estate. Okay. And I actually, I own a wholesaling real estate company. Now my company does it a modified version, but the way that this wholesaling real estate works is you go out, you find an undervalued property, you put that property into contract, and then you find a cash buyer 
which would be, uh, you know, an investor, a landlord, a, fl- a fix and flip guy, whatever it is, that would buy the contract from you. Not the house, but the contract. So say you get something in the contract for 230000 you might sell it to a flipper for 245000 He goes in, he spends a hundred grand fixing it up and tries to sell it for four twenty five. So slow down, slow down. This is interesting to me. Let's talk, let's talk about, because I'm sure people are sure. listening and they're going, what? What, what did you what did you just say so whole it's called wholesale contracting yeah so it's it's called wholesaling real estate okay and a lot of people get into it as an entry-level thing in real estate because you don't have to have any money there's no money you know you see the you're driving around you see these signs around town especially as you get into you know more lower in neighborhoods that say we buy houses for cash we'll pay cash for houses all this kind of stuff you call that phone number and you know a guy picks up gal picks up whatever and they're like, uh, yeah, I got this house. I'm in foreclosure. I need to sell it really fast. Or, hey, I just inherited this house. I need to sell it. Uh, hey, I've owned this house for 35 years. It's a total pile of shit. And I don't have any money to fix it. But I'm you know, behind on my taxes. I need money for this. My kid's going to college, whatever the reason. There's always a story, right? And they want to sell the house below market. So basically, they trade some equity for a quick, no-hassle sale if that makes sense, okay? Mm-hmm. So you put that property into contract, okay? You write a purchase contract. I'm gonna buy this house for $200,000, okay? Now, there's a whole bunch of guys out there that rent houses out. They're landlords, or there's guys out there that fix and flip houses, okay? And they'll buy them, put some money into them, fix them up, and then resell them. Well, those guys typically don't have marketing departments or an ability to source properties. So that's where the wholesaler comes in. He's basically a, a middleman between the investor and the homeowner. So he goes out and I always tell people that wholesaling is the art of finding discounted properties, deeply discounted properties again and again. So wholesaling is the art of finding deeply discounted properties over and over again. And the, then you go out and they, they maybe have an email list of 150 flippers and, and landlords in their, in their zip code. They send out an email and they say, hey, I've got this house under contract. I'm thinking of selling it instead of buying it. Uh, do you want to buy it? And, you know, two or three guys will show up. They'll look at the house and they'll say, yeah, hey, you, you know, uh, I'll give you 212000 for it. So you assign the contract. So you assign your rights to that contract to the fix and flip guy. And at, when he closes on the property, you get a check for $12,000, which is the difference of what you had it in contract for and what the flipper is buying it for. Okay. And so that's called wholesaling. You're never taking possession of the property. You're just uh, selling the contract on the property. So I have a company that does this. Now I do a hybrid version of this. Um, I don't actually assign the contract. I actually go in and buy the property, close on it and then immediately resell it. And the only reason is, is because I can, I have a lot of cash, so I can go in and buy it. A lot of people can't buy it, but I can squeeze more profit out of a deal. You know, where a wholesaler or flipper might have paid 212 for that house, if I buy it at 200 and then I put it on the MLS, I might find, you know, Joe, the homeowner, who's a little bit handy and he's willing to buy a fixer and he might pay 228 for that same house. So I make a little bit wider spread. There's very few guys that do what I do because it's very capital intensive, uh, but it gives me a, a wide blue ocean because I go in and I compete with these wholesalers every day. And these guys typically want a 10 or 14 day inspection period and then a 30 day close. And then I walk in and they might have two contracts already on the table. Mike walks in and I say, hey, uh, I can have you cash in hand closed in 72 hours. And I'm not going to do any inspections. I don't have any appraisal. There's no loan. I'm just going to stroke out a check, buy this. And, the, and sometimes I can even get it cheaper than what the wholesalers are buying it for just because of my speed uh, to close. Mm-hmm. So that's a hybrid version. That's a very advanced version because you do need a lot of capital to do, especially in California, to do that, that kind of wholesaling. So um, a lot of people get confused when they hear the word wholesaling. They think it's just assigning a contract. It's not. Wholesaling is the art of finding deeply discounted properties consistently. Assigning the contract is just an exit strategy out of that. So, but well, anyway, that, go ahead. Sorry. Well, so, so there's a number of questions I have then is 
one is because I'd heard that before people go buy real estate with no money down. I've seen people try to sell courses. Is that what they're trying to sell people on? You know, the no money down thing is possible. Um, here's the problem. Okay. That it's very difficult in a market like we're in right now. Right now we're in a very healthy real estate market. Uh, the market, you know, a lot of people say we're going down. I think we were going down uh, in November and December, the data now is telling us that we're coming back up by a point or two. We're certainly not at a you know 20% uh, incline, but the market is still healthy. And buying a house, no money down, is really a play for houses that cannot sell. Okay, it's not a wholesale play. It's a kind of a, that's a totally different market segment. Let's say you own a fourplex and it's in a really rough neighborhood. You've got some horrible tenants in there, and every time you go there, they're throwing beer bottles at you and coming out and wanting to fight. Okay, that might be the kind of property where you could buy that with no money down. You could go to the landlord and say, "Hey, I'll take over your loan. I'll start making payments. I'll clean it up. I'll invest in it. You know, etc. And I'll make a payment to you every month, and you don't have to worry about it anymore." That's where you get the no money down deals. You're not going to oh, get that in, in Laguna. No, 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 no. But uh, the, I, the reason I asked that is I went to a Jordan Belfort seminar, the Wolf of Wall Street, I don't know, sure. four or five years ago. And as you know, anytime you go to a seminar, you pay good money to watch someone you want to speak, speak. And then he goes, oh, I'll be back in an hour. Well, now we're going to bring in Fred. And then Fred pitches you for an hour. And I just, Tony Robbins does that. I, I really resent it. Like yeah. if I buy a ticket, I, I want to hear your stuff. I don't want to be pitched. And then Fred comes in and Fred goes, oh, here's how you can, you know, make money with no money down deals in Texas and distressed properties and stuff. And me, I'm first, I hear no money down and I think scam. And then two is right. I'm in a bad mood because I paid to hear Jordan Belfort talk not to be sold on whatever, some kind of course. And the course is always like 10 grand. Pay us 10 grand. And we will teach you how to buy real estate with no money down. I always thought that was an interesting incongruity. And then, of course, they have the, I mean, the, the sales tactics are beautiful. This 10000 can you get a higher credit card rating? Put it on your card. So is, I'm just wondering, what is it that those people are, in theory, teaching people? Quickly teaching the strategy of, Buying a house, no money down, which again is just like the fourplex thing that I talked about a second okay. ago. Okay, that's what they're doing. So, Mike, typically what these guys are doing is they're trying to get you to they're they're selling a no money down program for the type of thing I mentioned before, which is finding a really distressed, unwanted property. It can be done. I in my all of my years of doing real estate, there's far more lucrative ways. That's a sexy way to, I guess, push a program. And there's a lot of guys out there that don't have millions and millions of dollars, obviously, to invest in real estate. So they go to something like that and they hear the no money down. It is a technique. It's a crappy technique. Um, okay. And well, I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there's two or three guys that work in like East St. Louis, Missouri now that'll email me and tell me, you know, how great it is. But it, by and large, it doesn't work for most people. If you're in Detroit, if you're in horrible neighborhoods, yes, you can do some no money down deals. But, you know, what, you're making three, four grand on a deal? It's just not enough to move the needle, right? Well, that's what I thought. And I think that's one mm -hmm. of the good things this podcast can do is kind of steer people away from the scams of the – I don't want to call them scams because some people claim I made a 1000 so it's not technically a scam. But they're not buying what they think they're buying or they're not going to get the results they think they're going to get. Well, right. I, I'll tell you, I have spent over $300,000 on coaching and going to seminars, all about real estate. How much? Okay. Over $300,000 in the past 10 years. <clears throat> and I can tell you definitively that the very, very best instruction that I've received has been after those events, at the cigar place, at the wine, drinking a glass of wine, uh, just sitting by, you know, the fire pit, smoking a cigar out back behind the uh, hotel, sitting on the beach afterwards, going to breakfast the next morning. It's the it's the one on one with two or three really, really, really good investors and picking their brains, so to speak, you know, but talking to them on their level and find out, hey, what tactics are you using, et cetera. Now, I had to buy the seminar, the $5,000 or $10,000 seminar 
in order to be sitting on the beach with them. So I guess you could make the argument that, hey, <clears throat> you know, going to that gave you access to these guys. And not that I couldn't have called them up, but I just didn't know who they were. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I'll tell you that it's, that's really where the value is in, in knowing other people and networking with other investors because they come up with little techniques and stuff that there's a two degree pivot in a business that can be the difference between making a hundred grand a year and 800 grand a year in, in the real estate business. And so that's really where I found a lot of value. And it's why I do, I do this quarterly event called Whiskey Talk up in Napa Valley, where I actually have real estate investors. We all get together and it's a group of us that got sick of going just to the seminars. And so we just get together for four or five hours, smoke cigars, drink whiskey at my uh, uh, office warehouse, like an airport hangar out by the Napa airport. And, you know, we do that. I'm doing one on April 6th. And, you know, it's just one of the, and we raise all the money goes to, you know, uh, some kind of charity or something. This time it's going for a local artist, but that's where the value is in networking with those people and getting in front of them. So I would, I never would be afraid to reach out to somebody who's really successful and just ask them, how, how do I get in the same room with you? How can I, you know, sit down and talk to you. Yes, you can get some stuff from the seminars, but it's like anything else. You can get the same information on YouTube also. Yeah, I was, I become obsessed actually, even though I have no interest in it, watching a YouTube video on franchises and uh -huh. should you buy a 7-Eleven franchise? Should you buy, and the guy does the math. It's a really interesting channel. Apparently I'm not alone. A lot of the videos are doing hundreds of thousands of views. And I thought you could do something cool like that where, okay, this, you could do a whole thing just on what does a no money down deal look like? What you could even review courses, but without naming who does a course. So they like, they don't try to sue you or whatever. Right. Although we live in California, we have anti-slap statutes, very bad idea to ever sue someone who lives in California claiming they defamed you because you get attorney's <laughs> fees. I've had a lot of people make a lot of threats and I go, well, look into our anti-slap statute, bro. And um, go from there, but you, you know, you could talk about, okay, they're, they're selling you courses on franchise. For example, this guy tells you, well, those guys selling you the franchise course don't tell you when you buy a seven 11, you're really buying a job because right. you look at the yield and what you're kicking. And even though I have no interest in buying a franchise at all, I don't even know how I found the videos, kind of how I found <laughs> metallurgy videos. I'm watching a guy like <clears throat> hand forge a knife. Yeah. And, that's where you realize how the AI like rules us. I'm like, why am I watching a guy hand forge an ax? And how did this machine steer me into that? And how are they going to steer us all in 2020 and 2024, whatever your politics are into the direction that they want you to find. So somehow they steered me into the franchise videos. And I thought that was interesting. So I, th I think a lot of what you're talking about now is interesting. And maybe we should talk about s somewhere down the road, sy syst systemizing it. So here's yeah. what a no deal is. Here's what a wholesale thing is. Here's how to do your first sale. Here's how to do your second sale or whatever. Yeah, that, those are great ideas. I, I like that a lot. And there's probably, there's a lot of value in that because there's always a lot of people interested in real estate. You can make a lot of money in real estate. Uh, there's just so many different avenues to it. And you want to pick the one that best fits your personality. And, and it, you know, some of it's changing with technology too. Um, I originally, not I shouldn't say originally, but many years ago, I owned uh, uh, some IHOP restaurants. And when I went to sell my, my first restaurant after operating it for a while, I sold the franchise. I want to say it was like for 200 grand or something and sold the building for well over a million dollars. And that was the first time that I realized there's something to this real estate thing. And that's really what got me into it. You spend all these hours and all this time working in this restaurant, and these kind of closed in four walls and you're busting your butt. And you, you basically have a job, you know, you're, and you're, you're making okay money, but you're not killing it. Right. But when I went to sell the restaurant, I mean, sell the building and the land, that is where I killed it. I was like, I can't believe the money I just made off of selling this piece of property. Um, and that's really what got me going in real estate many years ago was, when I made a whole bunch of money off of selling my, uh, my restaurant and not off selling the business, but off of selling the building and the land. Yeah. I was about to say restaurants are the worst business to be in there. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I did that when I was young. Yeah. I would never, everybody, yeah. this is something too. I try to instill in people when they talk about running a business. Oh, I want to, I want to start a cafe. Okay. Well, okay. 
running a coffee shop isn't enjoying coffee. It's buying plastic cups, taking inventory. A homeless person goes into your bathroom and takes the crap all over the walls, and now you have to do that. Or people are shooting drugs. Coffee's like one percent of the business. Same thing. Oh, I love food and wine. I'm gonna, right. I'm gonna start a restaurant. Well, okay, now you know, no, no you're gonna start a place where employees are gonna steal your wine. You're gonna have to find an inventory control. And if you're new to it, you just get, you just get taken away because you don't even think that way. You're like, oh, we have all these beautiful things. Wait, what happened to that wine? Oh, we didn't think to have processes and control. So I'm glad well, it worked out in, for you. <clears throat> yeah, living in Napa Valley, I will tell you, I've, I know many uh, wine, winery owners, vineyard owners, and the happiest day of their life is the day they sell that winery. It is a very sexy, romantic business from the outside. But like you said, <clears throat> you're essentially a farmer. You've got right. employees, you've got you know, insurance issues, you've got regulatory issues, uh, zoning issues, I, you know, water rights issues. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's nothing to do with making wine. Liability, immigration law. Uh, right. You name it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, how all, that's how all businesses are. People think, yeah. I want to do that. And you look at the glamour of it, but nobody talks about the and – that, and that's what I've always liked to do and probably that's why – I've always had a good niche is I like to talk about all that stuff. Nobody wants to talk about. So you want to start a vineyard. Here's 10 reasons why you don't Here are 10 issues you're going to deal with. That said, if you're rich, it's a great tax shelter, which is something that the general public doesn't know is the reason most people start a vineyard is if you like wine and you have a ton of money, not too shut. You can afford it. You can afford those losses. And maybe you're actually looking for some tax losses. Yeah, and, and for some guys, it is a passion project. I mean, there's extraordinarily wealthy, you know, winery owners, billionaires, uh, you know, in Napa Valley that own wineries and vineyards. And um, are they involved in the day-to-day? -day? Probably not. <laughs> you know, uh, they hire the help and, uh, you know, they have it. They have the winery. And it's probably a lot like owning a baseball or a hockey team or a football or a basketball team. You know, it's a vanity play. Well, I got, yeah, or me, I got into journalism for a, a while and I wasn't even some like really rich guy. And because you want to do it, 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 it's nice. That's one of the benefits that a little bit of money can afford you is you can do a passion project. And in fact, one of my pet peeves of people who I'm friends with who are like mega rich is I'm, I'm like, where is your passion project, bro? What are you doing? What are you doing? You have, I know people, 50 million, a hundred million dollars, a net worth, and they're like begging me for retweets. And I was like, well, why don't you, why don't you pay somebody to write your tweets or I don't know, pay me or something. Right. right. Get a life, bro. Right. Like, get, what the hell are you doing? Leave me, you know, leave me alone. And there's, there's a lot of people like that, or they'll have a, they'll have a passion project, but they won't, they won't scale it. They won't do it right. It's, it's really funny. And sort of to me, that's why a lot of rich people, contrary to popular belief, most of the young guys think, Rich people are out there popping bottles and no, no, no. Most rich people are pretty just like everyone else. That's the thing is there's most people live very conventional lives and all these rich people, they finally could have a passion project and they don't. So I don't begrudge the, the people who start a vineyard as a passion project. That's great. But it's the younger people who think, oh, I'm going to start a vineyard as a business. No, right. please don't. Please don't. Yeah. You, you really need, and that, those types, almost any kind of business, there has to be some kind of X factor. And I, I don't know what that X factor is for, for you know, the person listening to this. But <clears throat> if, if, there's something in, if there's something in your business plan that gives it a X factor that's different than everything else out there, okay, whatever that is. As a matter of fact, I think I, I uh, tweeted this out the other day or somebody had asked me this. Maybe it was on Instagram. They're like, well, why, why are you doing a, a podcast? I'm like, I, I wouldn't be doing a podcast because there's 6,000 podcasts out there. I wouldn't be doing a podcast unless I was doing a podcast with somebody like yourself. You know, right. so that's the X factor, right? And so you wouldn't necessarily get into uh, wholesaling real estate unless maybe you partnered up with me and did wholesaling real estate in Tucson, Arizona or something, right? There has to be some kind of X factor or maybe you're, you know, I don't know, maybe you got a family member that works at Pepsi and, you know, they got a problem with their paper cup, you know, uh, dispenser or something and you got a way to fix that. And so you got an, you know, an in, but generally speaking, 
it's really tough to make it in business and, and wait until you have something that gives you an X factor. Now that could just be, you've just got a killer idea. It could be that, you know, a friend, it could be that you, you know, see something differently than somebody else, or you just, whatever it is, but that X factor makes all the difference. And don't get bogged down, you know, opening up a Dairy Queen or something and buying yourself a 25 year job. Uh, when you could be waiting for the right thing to come along or creating that for yourself. Yeah, that was buying a job really is a term that I never heard before. And it does apply to so many of these things. When you, when you, when you build a business, you're ideally creating an enterprise value and creating a business that you don't have to run. And most of the time, what people are doing is they are buying a job. Oh, I'm going to start a restaurant. Okay, you're going to work 100 hours a week. Now, now maybe that's your passion. God bless you. I'm not telling anyone not to. Because right. Lord knows how much time I've, I've spent doing journalism, which is a negative, a negative ROI, uh, negative ROI for sure. But at least I knew that going in. Right. That, that's the key. Yeah. Well, those are all, it's, it's good stuff. And it's, you know, again, I, I, I love having these kind of conversations because I, I think there's a lot of value there for folks. And I did see, uh, I direct people back to your, there's a tweet that you put on and maybe you pin it to the top. Uh, again, was one asking people what uh, they wanted to hear on the podcast. And I think that was really a, a great idea to throw that out there. We got a lot of really good responses from that on uh, on your Twitter feed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And we'll do a Q&A. There's a lot of things we can do. This is still a, a young podcast. So that's a lot of a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, Mike, it was a uh, good chatting with you today. And uh, I guess we'll uh, talk again soon. Perfect, man. Thank you.